Hello and welcome back to another edition of The Social Club uh, in association with tvsportsblog.com. Head over there, check out the website for lots of excellent content covering a wide variety of sports. So please, please do check it out. Now, I know there's no football. I know there's not a great deal to talk about at the moment. So we're taking some time to, to speak to some I guess I want to call them people of interest, people who have had careers in the game, uh, whether it be officials, journalists, players. um, And and on this edition, we're joined by a very, very special guest. He's been on the show before. He's one of the greatest referees of all time. He's got plenty of fantastic stories to share, um, plenty of memories to share. Uh, He's got some well thought out opinions and he's always up for a chat. So it's the brilliant Keith Hackett. Hope you guys enjoy it. Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna podcast, Mr. Keith Hackett. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing very well, thank you. Despite COVID-19, uh, or whatever they call it, um, where we're all struggling generally. Uh, but, you know, the government seems to have got a grip on things here. And, uh, you know, the, the NHS staff are doing a fantastic job. And uh, hopefully the Prime Minister will recover. Absolutely. We send our, our well wishes out to everybody that's suffering from from this horrible disease, including the Prime Minister. Mm. It is a real um, unprecedented time, isn't it? And I know that phrase keeps yeah. getting thrown about, but it really is. This is not something that any yeah. of us have had to deal with or, or been exposed to in our lifetime. So we can sit there and we can criticise people for how they're handling it and how they're dealing with it. But ultimately, there is no example here, is there? So it is a, a really serious topic and fingers crossed it will pass as soon as possible um keith yeah love to hear from you uh, on some of the proudest moments of your career of course you've been on the show on numerous occasions we're always uh, grateful to have you and we love hearing uh, some of your stories and some of your views and i thought this would be the perfect time given that football has come to a halt to reflect upon what's been a wonderful career um and i think that people don't really appreciate the sacrifice that officials make like yourself and and so i want you to be able to to tell us and provide us with that insight because your career was a fantastic one and it's one that involved a lot of hard work a lot of sacrifice and a lot of determination to reach the very very top so keith fire away my friend tell me about some of your proudest moments well i suppose always the the first visit to one this stadium because when you're a young referee and I was a young guy back in 1960 when I took up the whistle. Um, little did I think that I would have ever aspire to refereeing a football match at Wembley Stadium. My first visit, Harry, would interest you because it was in 1979. And it was uh, Arsenal v Manchester United, uh, where the game is now termed a five-minute final, where all the goals, Arsenal running out 3-2 winners, I think, against Manchester United and on that day I was on the line uh, just almost spectating really uh, because it had been a fairly boring affair up to that last five minutes when the goals just went in uh, in, in great fashion at both ends of the game but, but my real sort of pleasure then was in 1981 when again a return visit to Wembley and this time I was the man in the middle uh, to referee uh, Tottenham Hotspur uh, versus Manchester City. Um, I arrived on the uh, Friday evening, stayed at the lovely hotel on Bayswater Road, White, which the Football Association used. Went for a stroll on the Saturday morning, uh, bumped into a few spectators of both teams. Was then chauffeur driven to the stadium and walked out onto the Wembley pitch um, in anticipation. Uh, met then the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Um, and then it all went through pretty quickly. Um, the first game, a 1-1 draw. Um, I didn't know whether, in fact, I would be refereeing the replay because the, this was the first replay that had happened at Wembley yep. in an FA Cup final. And as I walked up the steps, I'm thinking, if the Queen Mother gives me the medal, I know I'm not going to get the replay. And uh, she handed, uh, uh, put out her hand, uh, I sort of shook the hand and did the, the bow, uh, as I'd been told to do, walked down the steps, smiling, because I hadn't got a medal, <laughs> and at the bottom of the steps, I was told I got the replay. 
And and the replay summed up football for me because in that first game, um, Ricky Villa had been uh, taken off. He didn't perform well. And I can remember him walking around the perimeter of the pitch, heading for the tunnel, which was at one end of the stadium, head dejected. And I'm thinking he's got his family there. Um, it's a, that really is something that he would never have wanted. And he was, must have been on the seat of his pants, completely dejected. And then, of course, we go to the replay on the following Thursday. Um, and uh, he scores what is considered by many to be the best goal at Wembley. It certainly was one of the best goals. Um, that dribbling run. Uh, I, I saw the airs on the back of my neck stand up, even though I've seen it 50, 60 <laughs> times. Because he, he was fouled on the way and I nearly blew. And he suddenly, suddenly realised I could have actually interfered with one of the most outstanding goals at Wembley if, if I'd have blown the whistle. I didn't, fortunately. Yeah. And he scored. And, and he, he, there it was. A few days earlier, very unhappy, dejected, now is on the winning team. Um, now buzzing. Obviously, <laughs> delighted, bubbling and everything that goes with it. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, and, and one of the nice things that happened was... Um, was, was the manager of Manchester City um, coming up and, and shaking my hand. And I thought that was a really nice touch. He was on the losing team. Yep. Uh, but, but again, memories that um, I, I, I brought forward almost every year because we still continue to play that goal, that, that particular goal. Absolutely. It is a goal that, that lives long in the history, uh, even if it was for that long. But, um. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but again, uh, uh, one story I tell about it was the fact that um, after the first game, I'm back in the dressing room, there's a knock on the door and there's a guy called Reg Payne, who's a football association referee officer, came in, thanked me for the game, and he said, right, you've got a choice now. Um, either you take the £35 check or you will get the medal at the end of the replay. Yeah. It was a no-brainer. I've gone straight, well, it's the medal. Um, and at the end of the second game, he came into the dressing room and said, right, I've got some really, really good news for you. Remembering the amount of money, Harry, that he taken on the game. And he said, the Football Association Committee have agreed that I can pay you the £35 match fee and the gold medal. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, to, to, think, yeah. to think nowadays that such a high-profile game would bring in... A, and and I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, in those days, of course, £35 was not what £35 is today, but even still... Yeah. To, to think that such a significant game and to think of all the sacrifice that you made. And of course, you very kindly sent me a couple of articles in the lead up to this, which I, I had a good read. And I actually didn't know about the level of sacrifice that you made to make it as a top level referee. And you've spoken about some of the jobs and the difficulties you had between balancing your work and, and being a referee. Do you yeah. want to tell us a little bit about that? And for the listeners that well, don't know and haven't read it, well, I mean, effectively, referees in my era were amateurs. Uh, we we got a little booklet, and it told us what our appointments were four weeks in advance, and uh, and and after, and therefore, the, there was always this pressure: one to get training in. I moved up from having been an apprentice in the steelworks to be eventually become sales director of a, of a company in Romford in Essex, selling garage doors. And, um, and therefore, my office was in Romford. Most of the games, even though the FA and the Football League were aware that I lived, I lived in London big week, you know, in a, out of a suitcase, yeah. always gave me appointments in the north. But so, so that was part of that mix. I can remember um, eventually, even when I moved from, and you know, I enjoyed the job. It was great. It took me around the country. I was able to take some of my customers to football matches. They got a, an inside view. That was a positive. But 
a couple of things was, I mean, I was in, after 81, I was put on the international panel. All my holidays went to uh, the referees international games to get time off. And uh, in, a, in a year when I had, uh, had a few holidays, I was suddenly appointed to referee New Zealand versus Australia in a World Cup game. And um, I went, I, you know, uh, I, I went out and refereed that particular game. I came off the field and, and into the back to the hotel and was informed I got a message. And uh, my wife had rung me to say, look, um, I've been, if you like, almost suspended for taking leave without permission. Yet at home I had a letter giving yeah. me permission to go. So in fact, that was the end of that particular job, a company I'd worked for for about 17 years. Um, so there you go. Was that, uh, was that sure. scary at the time, Keith? Was that scary to think that, you know, yes, you were doing what you loved and you were getting those opportunities and stuff, but when you, that hit you, that realisation that actually how am I going to earn enough money to support my family now, that must have been a, a scary time. It was because I was three months before I got another job. Um, and, it, and that was by chance. Uh, one of my former customers, a large builder's merchants group, the owner of that group had found out, he'd, he'd asked the question, where's Keith Hackett? And was informed that I understand, as he told me, that he wasn't aware that I'd lost my job at, at uh, Henderson Door. And uh, immediately offered me a job and said, look, I've got plenty of companies. Um, I'll give you a job because I know what you're doing. And then I took this job in Sheffield and um, I, <laughs> I was due a board meeting and I was um, then appointed to a, an important game. It was Stuttgart versus Fianor. And there'd been a lot of problems with Fianor in terms of their fans. And um, so... I, was, I gave the okay, yes, I'm going to referee the match. The company was happy. And then we, we had a special board meeting. And so the outcome was, yes, you can still take the match, but you've got to be here the following morning after the game to attend a board meeting. I had to achieve that when I looked back. Out of my own pocket, I had to charter an aircraft, which seems amazing. Wow. And if I told you, the, it, it cost me three grand. And, and we had diff great difficulties getting out of Stuttgart because uh, there'd been a, a hole a hole had been created on the runway. Yep. So the outcome was this was a two-seater plane that had come from Blackpool to pick me up in Stuttgart on the major airport. The airport when I arrived was was closed. I had to make contact with Stuttgart, and Stuttgart made contact with the chancellor who'd been at the game. And as a result, the airport was open for me and the plane was allowed to, late, allowed to leave. Uh, so it was, uh, and on the way, we were given permission uh, by the German airspace to, to fly actually in, uh, in their air force uh, corridors in order to get a quick passage. Wow. Which was, was quite amazing. So it just it shows you some of the things and the difficulties of of games. I mean, I was once uh, in a board meeting. We were making acquisition, and I came out of the uh, the board meeting, drove home, and my wife had got my bike at the bottom of the drive, and she said, "You're not aware that a game has been changed and brought forward." I'd had no correspondence. <laughs> You've got Wigan versus Luton in the League Cup tonight. <laughs> and if I left Sheffield at about six o'clock and arrived at Wigan, uh, which was not the easiest place to get to, at 7.30, um, ran into the, into the dressing room. Uh, my mate, the late Neil Midgley, was prepared, ready to, to referee the match. Quickly got changed out in the middle and refereed the game. Following morning, I got a call from the Football League saying I was suspended for one game for being late for the match. It shows, it shows you looking back 
how referees figured in the game. And Crazy. probably to this day, so, yeah. Would you say that's why you were so passionate about making referees uh, professionals as such, so that you could avoid these problems, so that you could focus solely on that as a career, and so that the referees of nowadays didn't have the challenges that, of course, you faced? Yeah, I mean, it was a massive influence, Harry, because um, I'd been at the 88 Olympic Games as a referee, and I'd sat, I'd sat amongst athletes, uh, watched the boxing, you know, uh, refereed my games. But what I had seen was coaches and trainers uh, and watch these guys train. And I'm thinking, you know, when I spoke to one or two of, of the uh, Nigerian uh, and Ethiopian runners, many of them based in London, um, I started to learn very clearly that diet, fitness, training, regimes that I was running as an amateur were not going to meet the, the, the upcoming demands of the game. And therefore... I put forward a proposal to the to the uh, Premier League through Sir Dave Richards um, that we should go professional. I helped write the paper uh, that that put it through, and then I watched it because then they said, "Well, are you going to run it?" And the answer was, "No, uh, I've got a job, and I'm committed in any case to a contract that I had. I would have had to see out." Um, and so I said no but about a year and a half later I took over from Philip Don and brought the sports science in uh, through uh, Matt Weston who's now Professor Matt Weston out in America uh, running pro referees uh, from a training point of view physical training point of view I brought in nutritionalists vision scientists that Man United use and thanks to Sam Allardyce uh, who I went to visit I could see some of the science that he was using, products like Prozone, yeah. analysis, data collection, all those sort of things that enable me to say, right, fine, I'm going to bring all those on board. And uh, it was appropriate because the speed of the game in, in that early period of me being PGMOL boss had increased by 40%. Wow. So all the clubs were getting professional and the speeds were getting quicker and more skillful players. You know, the groundsman and the, the playing surface has changed dramatically. Uh, so those changes took place. I, I witnessed them. Um, but then I also witnessed the increasing pressure on referees and the demands of the media um, and tried to take some of that pressure off the referees myself by um, almost on a weekly basis being in touch with the media. I never said no to an interview. Yeah. I felt that I needed, yeah. I needed to sell refereeing and give some value into refereeing and, you know, allow people to have a greater understanding. Look, these guys are prepared well. They do train well. Uh, they train four ty- times a week and, and they do make mistakes because up to that point in refereeing, nobody would admit that a referee makes a mistake, which is, like, you know, they're human beings. They do make mistakes. What you want to do is keep those mistakes to a minimum. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brilliant stuff. And always great to hear uh, about how, you know, the, the modern game was shaped. And we know now that, you know, it, it took a lot of sacrifice for referees, particularly in your era. And then we, we've seen that development mm-hmm. and we've seen the evolution, if you like, of refereeing. Um, Keith, tell us about another one of your, your proudest moments uh, as a referee. It's an incredible career, like I said, at the very top. I'm sure it was difficult narrowing these down, but uh, fire away on the next one. Well, I, you know, I, I think, Harry, a uh, few people, you know, I, I've been to over 100 countries involved in refereeing, uh, probably about up to 50 as an active referee. And so in that period, uh, I met royalty and I met presidents and, and all those things, completely away from my normal life. Um, but one of the games that stands out for me was Gdansk, Lechia de Gdansk versus Juventus. And uh, we got, if you like, solidarity being strong, the president, Jaruzelski, looking to be overthrown by Russia, pressures on. And suddenly, he's actually appointed to referee this game in Gdansk. Um, and um, 
we, we spent about 10 days as to whether it, the Polish government would allow me in. Um, because all the foreign uh, media had been banned, the, the, you know, Brit, even the embassy had been closed, all those sort of problems. Wow. And I arrived in Warsaw the, the day before the game. Um, they parked me into a hotel, and I had to remind them that I had to be in the city of the game, which was a UEFA uh, instruction, 24 hours before kickoff. And the, the general view was that couldn't be done. So there was a lot of negotiation. And eventually I clambered onto what was an antique aircraft. You've never seen anything like it, Eric. And the wind came through the windows. And we flew at 3,000 feet. And on, a, on numerous occasions, I kept saying, kept saying to the pilot who spoke English, why don't you go higher? And the answer was he needed to stay at that height so he could see the main road because he'd not, he'd not been allowed to fly into Gdansk and he hadn't got any flying papers. So we arrived in Gdansk uh, the day before the game. On the morning of the match, you go to the stadium, uh, you do an inspection, and on the way back from the ground, um, the car took a detour and I asked what was happening and they said, look, uh, Lake Valencia wants to meet you. And so, in a small, tiny room, um, away from any officialdom, I met Walenta. He was um, the moustache guy I'd seen on television. <laughs> uh, my, over uh, my hotel overlooked the Gadan shipyard um, with the water cannons and all that went. And uh, with, with, with the, the sort of lockdown, and we had a conversation. He loved football. He said he loved football. He watched English football. And uh, not as much because it wasn't broadcast, but generally through uh, stuff that had come through. Uh, however he got it, but he did. And I asked him if he was going to be at the match the following day. And he said, he just smiled. He didn't give me an answer. And then uh, during this game, um, which was packed, which was on television, Bonjek, who had signed for Juve a few months before the Polish international was making his first return, uh, return visit back to Poland. Uh, he was a hero in the eyes of the Polish fans. And, um, and then the ball, in, in the, early in the second half, was kicked. For some unknown reason, the player turned and kicked it to the side stand. And then... He didn't come back the ball. The crowd just opened up and uh, they all started screaming solidarity, solidarity. Wow. Uh, I was told afterwards, wow. that, I was told afterwards at that point that television had gone blank. That that was the, uh, the new way telling it. And, and, you know, when, when you look, you had the team playing and, and a fair number of top class players playing for that, that particular game. But it was a great, a great occasion. I mean, it, it, it's amazing when, you know, a lot, at that period, the wall was up, the Eastern Bloc was operating in those countries, and I find myself going to uh, Eastern Bloc countries. So it was amazing when uh, I was asked and invited to referee a game between uh, uh, West Berlin versus uh, Chemnitz, uh, and that was on unification night. And that wow. was another memory uh, you know I refereed the game which was insignificant really compared to then driving to watch people with sledgehammers and everything else uh, knocking the wall down wow. the guy who'd been looking after us had shown us very proudly on the day of the, of the match um, his Trabant motor vehicle and for band, I looked around it, it was made of paper mache and it had an engine. Well, my engine on the lawnmower was bigger. <laughs> and I was very polite. He was extremely proud. But that evening, uh, in came uh, car transporters and parked them on the, on, on the side of the roads. I mean, obviously wide freeway type roads. And you could see the cars, the brand new cars being parked up. And I said to my guy, 
uh, who was looking after us, the Polish guy, uh, he looked at me and we had a conversation. And then we, he started opening the car and he smiled. And I'm thinking that morning he'd opened his Trabant with great pride and now he's seeing something completely different. And uh, he then got into negotiation and bought, bought one of the cars at the side of the road, which is simply amazing. And I'm thinking, how did he have that money? Because Chancellor Cole, who I met later, um, a name drop, had offered uh, East Germany a two for one. So two marks for every one. I, I don't, I, it's slotty or something like that, I think was their currency. Uh, had offered two for one. Going on what was in the bank, what he didn't realize was that um, most people living in East Germany didn't trust the bank, so what cash they earned going out for work, they kept in the homes. So all of a sudden, this pile of money was coming out in, in notes and nearly actually crashed the uh, the, the German government's uh, finances at that particular time. But uh, uh, those are the things that come... You know, football becomes then a a greater sort of sport because for a referee, it gives you an insight and into a country that you'd never go on holiday. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but but that's what that's what football tends to do. I guess you could say it provided you with a lens through which to watch history unfold. I guess when you when you look at it that way, which is which is fantastic. Um, Keith, tell me about uh, another one, your third one, uh, your third moment that you, you look back on fondly. And I know I, well, I keep saying it. I'm sure there's been plenty, um, and I'm sure this has been really difficult to narrow those down. But tell me your, your, your third one. Well, as a young boy, uh, I was, if you like, brought up in football. Uh, my father was a, a fan of Sheffield Wednesday. And so... He was a steel worker uh, and worked extremely hard. But the release for him was football and pigeon. Uh, you know, we lived in the terrace house. We didn't have a salubrious background, but we were really well looked after by our parents. And the treat for us was my dad taking us to a game of football. And that was Sheffield Wednesday. So we lived about three miles from the ground. And therefore, we set off early, uh, walked through, if you like, some of the land where people had the private gardens and, and, and various things. Um, and we stop on the way at the pub. My dad would have a pint. Uh, we would have a, an orange, a, a bottle of pop and, and a packet <laughs> of crisps. And then we get to Hillsborough. And, um, you know, I can remember the days of, of, of my hero, Derek Dooley, the gingerhead number nine, centre forward, who knew where the back of the net was. Sadly, his career was brought to an end with a with a tattle at, at Preston North End, where he resulted in him getting gangrene and he had to have his leg off, and that was the end of his career. But I got to know Derek really well. But walking to Hillsborough with the crowd, the build up, you know, the hot dog sellers, or the program sellers, the atmosphere as a youngster was like a mosaic. It was fantastic, and then you get onto the car. And I can remember, Harry, because it was full, you'd, you'd get, if you like, um, over the heads of the players, you'd be handed down to the front. So you'd almost do a ski sort of, uh, uh, sort of approach out over the heads of the spectators down to the front of the, uh, the, 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 the stadium. Yeah. And the, and the, and then, you, you know, where all the kids congregated and we'd watch the game. Um, and in 1979, I got this call to appoint me to the FA Cup semi-final. And it was Liverpool versus Arsenal. And I'm thinking, wow, that's fantastic. And then he said at Hillsborough. And he just went into a bit of a day then because I'm thinking, wow. And I've got a few weeks build up for the match. Uh, and I decided that, you know, where I lived had been raised to the ground. The terrace houses had gone. There were no houses there. There was a bit of a ski slope. And so I drove to the uh, where I used to live. I, I parked the car exactly where I, 
house for. Uh, there was no cars around. There's nobody around. Uh, blocked the car and walked to the stadium. On the way, one or two people recognised him and said, "Where are you going?" They didn't realise it was that way, but I got a <laughs> kit bag on, on my in my hand, and I said, "Well, I'm going to the game." And uh, a few a few sort of rang me after the game saying, didn't realise you were a referee, saw you walking. And so stepping out onto the uh, middle of the stadium where you've watched as a boy and grown up as supporting that particular team, with a passion that comes as a supporter um, and a love for the game, it was an incredible moment just coming down the tunnel and, and going onto the pitch. Full house, referee the game. It was a draw. It, it, you know, people tell me it was boring. For me, it wasn't. Um, I got two teams, uh, two great teams to referee. And uh, it, they drew. And uh, the following week, I had the replay and they drew again. And at that point, the FA decided you can't have the third replay. And so I was taken off the game. But referee Pat Partridge, a North East referee and a good referee, took over uh, that particular uh, Game, but it, it, it you know fantastic memory, and it's one that's special to you because you were almost retracing those steps that you used to make as a boy, but now you were yeah. the referee in the middle. Yeah, it's it's an incredible story, isn't it? Fantastic. Yeah. Well, you never thought that as a young youngster watching a football match, you'd be on the same field. Neither did I at that time think that Derek Dooley would would in fact become a friend. I mean. He became the manager of Sheffield Wednesday and on Christmas Eve they fired him and, and we still talk about that as not the right thing to do by Sheffield Wednesday. And then he crossed the city and he became the manager and then the CEO of Sheffield United where I was always greeted. And he, and he, used, to, he used to occasionally say to Wednesday, I see a son watching me play. <laughs> you know, it was, he had a great sense of humour but... Uh, you know, those are the things. And, and you know, uh, my first game at Anfield, I, I can remember refereeing very early in my career um, at Anfield, great occasion, listening to the song and then running out onto the pitch. On that particular game, um, I cautioned Emily Hughes um, <laughs> very early on. Uh, he was unhappy with me for the rest of the match. But again, he was somebody who, who came to manage Rotherham United, which is on our doorstep, really, and then started to live in uh, in the, the outskirts of Sheffield, in Derbyshire, I think. And he started playing in junior football, uh, with grassroots football, which was amazing, playing for a club team, because he loved football. And there, there was the former England captain, Liverpool player, playing in a local club team. And I used to referee that club team. And, and we became quite quite uh, big mates until of course sadly he's passing and I think it was about three or four days before he passed I got a phone call from someone who'd been looking after him saying would I meet him at Bramall Lane and watch a football match and I sat with Emily and he was as critical of the referee he as he was always critical of the referee <laughs> that's how he would speak to me when we met the referee the, the previous week whoever it was was awful he <laughs> he was awful but uh Again, that's the, I think, Harry, the passion uh, that we gain from football is to watch our heroes and to watch footballers, you know. And I think the greatest pleasure I've had is, is having the, the honour of, of being on the football field with some of the great players, you know. I mean, I, I talk about Ian Wright because he was a hard-working forward who knew where the net was. And at the old Ivory Stadium, you know, greeted into those uh, marble steps and the commissioner going to the secretary's desk and saying, you know, I've arrived, getting to the, uh, the dressing room and, and, and then eventually running out at Ivory, knowing full well that there's a big clock at one end and <laughs> you couldn't <laughs> play a minute short or a minute, a minute over. Yeah, happens. for sure. <laughs> but, but it, but it, you know, uh, running alongside Glenn Hoddle and, and watching him pass the ball. My favourite player, Kenny Dalgleish, um, giving 100%. You know, 
I did. I was very honoured to referee uh, a testimonial game. I'd refereed Ju- Juventus in in Milan, and um, I was asked how was John Charles, and I was able to. Uh, I think the guy was um, the guy who owned um, Ferrari and other companies. He was the president of the club, and he he, he actually asked openly after the game, could he meet me to discuss John Charles? Wow. And I said, he, you know, and, and I, he, John Charles was his hero. And, and I said, well, sadly, I just learned that week that he'd, uh, he'd, he'd run into financial difficulties on a hotel project and therefore was struggling. And uh, seven, I think it was about 10 days later, I got a call from Juventus asking me, would I referee a testimonial match at Ellen Road? And uh, and I went to Ellen Road and uh, John Charles would only allow that game to take place if Bobby Collins, it could be his testimonial as well. So it became a joint testimonial game for John Charles and, and Bobby Collins. And um, quite remarkably, uh, Kenny Dalgleish that evening turned out and played for Leeds United for a spoke in the game um, pe- very few people are aware of that but what I can tell you is this uh, in about I don't know probably 85th minute he puts a ball out to the left wing and there's a young player who's come on you know what happens in testimonials let's give yeah. so Fred Smith a run out Fred whoever he is doesn't run for the ball and I tell you I had to part Dal Gleish and this young player as we were leaving <laughs> the field of play because he's saying to him, if you want to be a professional, the game's 90 minutes and no less. And I, I always remember that sort of comment from Kenny because it showed his passion. He always showed that in in all the games that uh, I watched him referee. So that that was a, another another game that I was involved in. But but one of the best lunches I ever had, which is involved in football, Harry, was. My mate was Neil Meesley, the late Neil Meesley, a fellow ref- uh, referee, but a great raconteur and a great after dinner speaker. He was truly great and uh, sadly passed away with, with cancer. But I got a call from him saying, Look, I've ordered lunch for you at Bolton Wonders. We're going we're gonna to meet in that loft out. And uh, so I arrived at the old ground at Bolton and uh, went into this area and sat at a Two of us, Neil and I, sat at the table and laid out for four people. And if I tell you, for the next couple of hours, I was royally entertained by the Tom Finney and Matt Lofthouse and Neil Midgley. I can tell you that was a lunch to remember. With I the can story, imagine. <laughs> you know, the Lion of Vienna, uh, Tom Finney. They talked about uh, doing a... We were on about testimonials at that particular time because a Leeds United player had a testimonial fullback and donated a million pounds to a, a particular hospital where his sister had been treated an Irish player I can't remember his name and um, and we talked about testimonials because Neil and I were always invited to referee them and I said well did you play and of course then Grimsby Town in the area was a, a top top team and he talked about going to a game at, at Grimsby to play for a, a well-known international player who was finishing his career. And I sort of said to him, well, what did you get? A gold watch or a gold pen? No, we got a bag of fishy. <laughs> and, and, and at which Tom Finney said, yeah. And I never got over that because you allowed that bag to run in my brand new Morris Minor car, <laughs> right? And so you've got a picture of that. And then Nat Loftow said, well, when I arrived home, I knocked on the doors of where I lived, handing out fish. He said it must have been about midnight. And then he said, an hour later, you could smell the fat burning and the, and the fish being cooked. And I said, <laughs> the whole neighbourhood was having wait? fish. <laughs> yeah. I said, well, why didn't they wait for the following day? And he goes, fresh fish, son. They don't, we didn't have, we didn't have uh, refrigerators then, you know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's only, but how the stories link, but not only is the time periods, but in their, t- in their period, of course, they talked about top-class players 
yes, we know the story of the miners. Well, you know, uh, I, I was in the middle of a mining community. I think Barnsley, which is 12 miles away, um, had some big pits. And players who either played in the steelworks or were in the pits would walk from the Saturday morning shift and then play football in the afternoon in, in, in front of a full crowd. You know, so it, it's how the game was shifted. Absolutely. And sometimes, you know, okay, I watched a, a bit of an interview uh, about 10 days ago because currently, I talked often about the lack of contact between the current modern players and the spectators, um, the money, the, um, the, the way they come to the ground, earphones and all that, Harry, compared to what it used to be. And something's lost in that. But then I pick up the story that, you know, young Marcus Rashford is involved in charity work, genuine charity work, where he's helping kids, uh, I think it's homeless kids or... or kids that have come from broken homes and he's donating money that allows and ensures that they're fed and all that goes with it and you know he's not he's not publicized that at all and he's not doing it because of the current problems he's been doing it for a long time and you suddenly realize just a minute there's lots of those actions going on and and I'm beginning to read those now on a fairly regular basis of what players are actually doing yeah, there is and, there is a lot doing it. Sort of, I was having this conversation with Kevin Campbell earlier in the week where we were talking about this, and we were talking about the disconnect nowadays between the players and the fans. And he told me a really nice story about Rocky Rowcastle, who had after Arsenal yeah. had won the league at Anfield in eighty nine, when they got back to Highbury, there was a fan who was drunk on the steps outside, and that you know <laughs> Rocky took the time to sit and talk to him and have a beer with him and speak about how his night went. And when you hear things like that, you know, I, yeah. I turned around to Kevin and I said, I feel like my generation has missed out on that sort of thing. Um, but you're, yeah. you're absolutely right. There are lots of footballers doing good things, but I think the media, the way it's become where, you know, they're always looking to, I guess, build people up and then chop them back down. I think a lot of these players nowadays would rather just do these things on the quiet because they know they're doing good. Yeah but they don't necessarily feel the yeah. need to, to brag about it, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I can understand that because, you know, um, I, I've been in the odd restaurant when suddenly, you know, in the past, the football has appeared and he's absolutely inundated, I'm, I, you know. And, you know, at the end of the day, almost for girls what he's eating because he's, he's getting, can I have a photograph, can I have a selfie, can, I, can you sign me this, that and the other. So they are to some degree under pressure. Of course, it's, it's, it, it is now more than ever a, a truly professional environment. I mean, uh, lots, of, lots of players don't, don't touch any alcohol. Uh, they train like crazy. They're super fit. They watch, they watch what they eat. And not every player, of course, earns the hundreds of thousands. We've got to recognise that there are, there are players below. I mean, some players, this this you know, a few months ago, Burry lost their jobs uh, because the club folded. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they don't, they don't turn the big money. And, you know, we, I, I know of a player, I'll, I'll not name him, who, who played for Bolton. And when Bolton got into serious uh, financial difficulties, uh, lost his job at Bolton, uh, which was probably, you know, a, an hour's drive away from where he lived. And all of a sudden... He's got to go to another part of the country, which involves him in either a train journey every day or, a, you know, a drive and a lengthy drive. So there is a degree of inconvenience that players don't tend to move houses now anymore. Uh, they have to they have to put up with a great deal of travel. Absolutely. But the other interesting, you know, I, I, I just I just think that there are other aspects to to some of these players that we're not aware of. And ought to be. 
Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You make some great points there, and you, you you've spoken about about the shift in the sport, and you're absolutely right. There has been so many shifts and so many changes over the years that you know sometimes we have to just take a step back. And I think you've summarised it brilliantly that there is more to these guys than than what is is being let on at times. And that brings me nicely into my next question, which is in regards to the current situation. We know that COVID nineteen is sadly taken the lives of many and and you know football has been suspended which i say on every show was absolutely the correct decision because first and foremost it's about people being safe um but i wanted to get your thoughts on the way players have been portrayed now because i think that unfairly i think certain members of the government have come out and they've almost insinuated that people should go after footballers to get them to help to get them to contribute where do you stand on that? Do you think the treatment has been unfair? Because as far as I'm concerned, there are plenty of other high-earning people in this country and footballers just feel like an easy target. I think what started it off, Harry, was really, um, to some degree, Liverpool Football Club, a club that I admire and I've been to and always enjoy, passionate fans, great players, all that goes with it. When they announce that they're going to, to furlough, their administration staff. They're going to expect the government to pay 80% of their salary and they would pay 20% or even let them exist on 80%. And you suddenly realise, oh, just a minute, this, is, this doesn't seem right to me, uh, that a club that is operating in the million, owned by a billionaire, this suddenly can't stand the, the, the co- or cover the cost for a two, three month period of, of the administration staff within the club who don't earn the, the big sums of money. And therefore, I think that then kicked in and alerted everybody to say, well, just a minute, what's happening with the players? And of course, not help when Barcelona and Messi agree that he's going to take a 70% pay cut. And then Juve with Cristiano Ronaldo say, well, actually, we're going to suspend payment. We're going, to, we're going to hold payment back to a point one assumes that when they do kick off, that payment or those shortfall in earnings will be, will be made up. Yep. Um, and then, then Gordon Taylor at the Professional Football Association coming out and actually saying the opposite, almost saying, or oh, I don't think he's been misinterpreted, he may be, but I certainly quoted as saying that he thinks there should be no drop in the salary or earnings of the player at all. Um, so for me, I think once again, football puts itself and the image into the dark corner of projection of greed. And, and there's, you know, there's people who are struggling to get food and all that goes with it. So I think this should have been allowed to be a private decision, kept low key within the clubs where the the Premier League and the clubs could have come out and said, our players are making a contribution, yeah. however that is or whatever it is. And I think they're always, on the, they're always on the back foot. They don't think about the fan who's thinking to himself, you know, I've paid 500 quid and I'm not going to see the games. And they're talking about quitting and they're thinking... Well, what's going to happen to my money then? Am I going to get it back from the clubs, you know? Yeah. Uh, the refund and all that. It, it's, <coughs> excuse me, it's, it's our perspective. It's true. And, and so and I think that... Sorry, from, from, <laughs> from my perspective, you know, when, yeah. I, when I read that there was... I read that there were certain clubs you know, taking this action. And I read that Newcastle United were going to do it. I read that Norwich yeah. City were going to do it. And even with Newcastle United, when you look at Mike Ashley, you still, you, you can't get your head around it. But I kind of got that. When Tottenham did it, when Tottenham announced that they were going to do it, I was yeah. the first person to have a go. Um, not just because I'm an Arsenal fan, but because Tottenham had announced incredible profits. You know, they, they've just built yeah. this incredible stadium. Um I know they don't always spend as much as some of the other bigger clubs, if you like, in the transfer market, but they're not short of a few quid to make sure that their staff get paid. And then when I heard Liverpool did it, 
I was really, really disappointed because as even as an Arsenal fan, I've got huge respect for Liverpool as a football club, what they yeah. stand for. And, you know, they always talk about Shankly's values. And then to hear they were doing yeah, that, absolutely. it just, to their credit, they've reversed that decision after, you know, being under a lot of pressure. I think the damage is probably still done in terms of their reputation um, and, and the impact that it's going to have there. But for me right now, if Liverpool have reversed their decision, the one that everybody should be looking at, and again, it's not because I'm an Arsenal fan, is Tottenham Hotspur. I can say it straight. If Arsenal were to come out in the next few days and say that they're doing the same thing, I would be bitterly disappointed because Arsenal, Tottenham, we can afford these to keep these staff on for a few months. You know, if this drags on for six, nine months, 12 months, that's a different story. And then you need to reevaluate it. And then you can say, why don't you know these then these clubs maybe have a right to to jump on board but i think they have a moral obligation to to do the right thing here uh, i agree uh, 100% i mean when we look at liverpool which you know there are deprived areas in liverpool let's let's make it uh, clear here that there are unemployed there's unemployed across the country there's people struggling uh, you know and as a result of that i think you know, the relationship of a fan with Liverpool Football Club, as it is with most clubs, is really close. And some will see that the club is taking money off them rather than off the government. Because they will say, in, in the way that they go about it, well, we're paying the taxes. And our taxes are paying for the football club. That cannot be right. And I yeah. think morally, it's not right. Um, yes, it's a business. But, I, you know... I've, I've watched things happen. Look, I, I was a consultant to a company in the North East, so I know that I've lived in the North East for a couple of years, and I know it really well. And I always remember when uh, Newcastle United did a deal where you could pay a £1,000, Harry, and that guaranteed your, your season ticket for the next five years. Yeah. That £1,000 never went towards the cost of the season ticket. It was just like somebody giving the club a grand. And, and I can remember my boss um, coming to me and saying, look, Keith, what I've done, I've put a, I was the, uh, the di director consultant of the business, and he said, look, what I've done, I've set aside a quarter of a million pounds because our staff are going to come in and they're going to want to borrow this thousand pounds. He was ahead of the game. And I'll tell you, that quarter of a million went after about 10 days. It had gone. Wow. We employed a lot of people, but they're all borrowing that money to put towards the club to buy this debenture, which, which was a joke. Uh, and I think sometimes when clubs do that, um, they, do a, they do more harm than good. And I, and I think we've just got to say, look, let's try and get a community connection. They're doing a lot of work. You know, I... I, I was in the Premier League office for a period of time in my career as a PGMR boss. That's where we were cited. And they do a lot of work for charity. They, you know, uh, they do a lot of work in training and education and various other things around the world. Premier Skills brings, you know, they send coaches out at their cost to coach coaches out in Africa and Vietnam and various other places. I've been on those courses uh, running referee courses. So I know that the investment is there, but sometimes you don't broadcast it as well as they could. And I think this is generally for the Premier League has tarnished their image uh, uh, quite considerably. Absolutely. And fi finally, Keith, the, the last question I, I wanted to ask you um, this evening, just conscious of time as well, um, is... In terms of the Premier League now, you know, you've worked behind the scenes, you, you know you, more than we do, you, I'd say you're the, one of the most be best qualified people, sorry, to answer a question like this. And I think there's been lots of back and forth about it for weeks now, even months um, with all that's going on. If the Premier League season cannot continue, what happens? How do the Premier League move forward now, in your opinion? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great question. You know, I mean, it is a massive business, the Premier League. The, the 20 clubs, of course, are shareholders. Beyond that, you've got clubs who are on parachute payment agreements. You've got clubs 
were vying for promotion and playing that hundred million uh, pound game, as it's now called. Uh, and then have you got a true champion? Because if you know Liverpool are currently the the, the runaway winners, if you like, but they haven't won it. <laughs> so yeah. you then are going to bring in arguments forever if they suddenly say, as Belgium have done, and getting criticised, the league is cancelled. You know, the FA took a decision a few weeks ago. I mean, I'm very very much involved with the grassroots club. And we're vying for promotion. Penistone Church FC in the North East Counties League. Not a bad league. And um, and they're, they're just, without a meeting, without even discussing with the club, somebody comes and sends a note saying, the competition's cancelled. Everything, you know, grassroots football up to this level is finished. No consultation whatsoever. I think behind the scenes, there'll be a huge amount of consultation. The bottom end of the clubs, Harry, whoever they are, those clubs at the bottom, they'll be arguing that the league should be cancelled now, null and void. <laughs> because then yeah. they're going to get another season in the Premier League. And the clubs at the top will be arguing because they're saying, well, you can't give Liverpool a trophy because we're in with a chance. And therefore... The new CEO, Richard Masters, who took over from uh, Richard Scudamore and, uh, and the remaining directors of the, the organisation have got, have got a real task on their hands. Because behind it all is what does television want? Yep. Now, because of the cancellation of the World Cup, because of the cancellation of the Euro Championship, and the current position of, of companies like Sky and BT doing everything possible to fill their slots in, in the media world, which is how many times can you play a, a repeat? Uh, and remember that some of them have not been there that long and don't have a huge historical storage of films that they can go back on. Yeah, i.e. BT Sport, for example. Yeah. So they're going to be pressing for live sport and and I think that the pressure will come from the media where the media will want to games to take place I've got a, I think I've got a simple view it's probably not as simple I think first of all everything should be done to try and conclude the competition that's the first thing if that is not feasible the next stage is that they should have a series of playoffs within the Premier League, the Championship, League Division 1 and 2. And almost like the playoffs, but extend the clubs that's involved in it. So if, for example, Harry, you've got to take the top six clubs and, and have a playoff for the winner of the, of the league, yep. so be it. And lots of Liverpool fans will be howling at that. In the same way that you have the bottom three clubs and the top three clubs of the division of the championship playing off, or whatever the number has to be, to determine promotion and relegation. Now that might be one way out, but let me tell you that every club who have lawyers and barristers and a pot of gold—not everyone, but they have a pot of gold that says legally, whatever you do, Premier League. We're going to challenge you. Yeah. And ultimately, ultimately, the, the, again, I repeat, the Premier League is owned by the 20 clubs. They are the shareholders. And therefore, you can guess that around that table, there's going to be 20 clubs, each with a different view, to say how we're going to run it. And, and I think the, deli the delicate bit, the delicate bit is how can they recoup and how can they reduce their exposure to debt in relation to the television deal? Because that is the main income. And then if I was a sponsor, because I'm a marketing man at the background, let me tell you, I've contracted with every club as a shirt sponsor or as a, a provider or whatever, Ali. I've, I've done it on the basis that the games are televised and there are X number of games to be played, and I'm going to feature on a number of those. So, if the game, if again the competition is cancelled, 
the the amount of money that I paid you for my shirt sponsorship, I, I need a I need a re, you know I need a payback on it. Absolutely, and it, you're absolutely right when you say th- this is such a complex matter because, like you yeah. said, there are teams that will want the season to be non- deemed null and void, and there are teams that won't. And you know, when I look at the Premier League as a as a Premier League supporter, I guess I follow a club that are in the Premier League. I can look at yeah, Liverpool. Right. And I can say, yeah, they haven't won it yet, but if Liverpool were given the title, would I be that upset? No, because they're going to win it. The problem comes in the lower half of the table where you're talking about the futures of clubs being at stake here. Relegation is a real, real issue. And then you look at Leeds United, for example, been out of the Premier League since 2004, on the verge of getting back into it, and they could have that snatched away. So it is such a complex matter. I think you're absolutely yeah. right when you say that wherever, the, whatever direction the Premier League decide to go in, there will be challenges. And I think the, the financial impact of something like this, if we're unable to finish the season, could see us, I guess, as if sort of pressing the reset button on football as we know it. We could see the salaries drop. We could see the transfer fees go back to something like they were in the past. And I think it, it could cause a massive, massive change. I think you're right, Harry, because at the end of the day, look, the businesses that are the funders, if you like, those sponsors that I talk about, they pay huge amounts of money uh, into clubs uh, by way of, of deal, are also struggling. They're in the same boat. You know, if, if, if you're an airline um, or if, if you're a local company, um, all those companies that sponsor football generally through, through the pyramid uh, are all financially stretched at the moment uh, in terms of their cash flow. There's no business that can't be. You've got to be massively uh, wealthy. I mean, we talk about Tottenham, but, you know, the, and the, the profit that they've earned, but remember, they've got, somewhere has got to pay back two billion quid for the cost of their stadium. Yeah. And the interest on that is no small, small amount of money. So, it is a massive complex issue. It's, it's easy It would be easy, let's say, for the Premier League administrators, the CEO, to say, well, let's cancel it and we'll start again next year. Um, And maybe one of of the answers is that you bring it forward, that you actually say, right, we'll we'll restart the season and have a cut-off. But again, I think there are many areas that I've sat in those meetings. I've sat at the summer conference of these clubs and uh, there's some very, very clever people, financially, strategically, media savvy, all those people sat around the table. These, these are some really articulate guys who yeah. can put forward a massive argument as to the opposite of whatever and anybody else thinks. So I think it is a, I think it is a game changer, but ultimately at the end of the day, we'll come through it and you, you know every club wants the very best players. And therefore, we'll then get back into the scenario of, of the value of the players that each team runs. Um, my fear is that they'll suddenly cut back on the cost of the academies. They'll cut back on the administrator. Can we do a lot less with... Can we do the same with a lot less staff? Yep. You know, and and it will be those areas that they'll start to look to try and make the saving. Um, you know, we've got, you know, I mean, we go back. Um, you know, I I can often remember going to to Arsenal and Main Road and all that, and and, and meeting the groundsman uh, at Arsenal who was absolutely well. He won the he won the award on a almost a, a consistent annual basis. He was the top groundsman. <laughs> But I, I can always remember, like the staff were very small, and I'm thinking they've got they've got a club and they've got a training ground, and therefore he, he was cutting the grass at Ivory and then dashing to the uh, the complex uh, uh, in uh, Radley to do to do the grounds there. So yep. all those all those numbers, if you like, might get reduced, and and I think a number of people that's currently involved in football might get offloaded. Yeah, uh, which agreed. is which is sad. Because I've seen that happen in the past. You know, I've seen incidents where 
They've had a very experienced uh, secretary of a club who's been there forever. And, you know, you greeted, hello, Keith, nice to see you back, and all those sort of things. Or the phone call on a Friday night or a Friday morning saying, Keith, might need you across some because our ground's looking a bit iffy. I need an early inspection. Can you come through this evening? Yep. And I've, I saw a change in that with a, when I was at the PJMRL 10 years ago. I, I could see that they were offloading some of those guys, bringing in newer, sort of younger guys. And then when it came to those difficult areas of player contracts and or ground, is it fit, is it not, involvement of the referee, you suddenly lost that years of experience, which was, which was quite sad. And you were turning up and asking, why haven't I been called in before? You know, I yeah. should have been at this ground yesterday. I could have avoided fans travelling. And it was almost like, so what? Yeah, it's, it's just, it's one of those that. things, isn't it, Keith? We don't, we don't know how this is going to unfold. We can only no. speculate, we can only guess, but hopefully it has a minimal impact and we can see football as we know it and as we love it return uh, as soon as possible. Keith, it's been an absolute yeah. pleasure. Thank you once again pleasure. for taking time to, to come on the show. We really appreciate it and love hearing from you. So thank you so much and we hope to speak to you again Thanks, soon. Harry. Take care. That was the excellent Keith Hackett, an absolute gentleman, and it was a pleasure to have him back on the show once again. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. Don't forget to leave us a review. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, uh, leave us a comment. You know the drill by now. And we'll be back uh, on Monday with another episode, and I'll be joined by another Arsenal legend. Uh, So stay tuned for that one. More information coming in the next few days. But we've got a few of these lined up for you, and I hope you're going to be enjoying them over this really difficult period so we're trying to keep it going we're trying to keep uh, people um, occupied during these strange and unprecedented times but most of all uh, make sure that you're safe take care of yourselves take care of your families and I'm sure that normality is not too far away cheers